Good morning. Uh, once, um, before I became a rather dull thing called a development officer of the International Baccalaureate Schools and Colleges Association, I was a teacher. Uh, and the last time I taught Saturday morning school was in 2001. Um, so this is a bit of a shock to the system. Uh, but I do have to warn you that um, when I did teach uh, Saturday morning school in 2001, uh, I was used to 40 minute lessons. Uh, and as far as I can see, I've started speaking after the time I'm meant to have finished uh, in terms of the programme. Um, so this could be a rather um, rapid play uh, piece of work. Um, before I, uh, I retired from being the headmaster, or indeed the chief master, um, of King Edward's School, Birmingham, two years ago. And what I'd like to do uh, in, in what is quite a short period of time, I'd just like to start in a school, in a place, and then move out to uh, move out to this country's education system, the UK's education system, and then into the wider world of the world's education system, and in particular, um, what the International Baccalaureate is trying to do. Um, so, in the future of chess and education, I'm really only talking about uh, the education bit. Um, but. Um, I want to start here because this is a picture of what King Edward's School Birmingham looked like between the 1830s uh, and the 1930s. It stood in New Street, slap bang in the middle of Birmingham. Um, it uh, was uh, knocked down in one of the greatest acts of uh, Birmingham vandalism, but there were many great acts of Birmingham vandalism uh, in the 30s and 40s, but this building was designed by Sir Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin. Uh, and if you are British, you might like to know that the, uh, the architects of the Houses of Parliament, perhaps the most iconic of all British buildings, was designed by Sir Charles Barry and Augustus Pugin. Indeed, this is the prototype of the Houses of Parliament. Uh, whereas they're now trying to refurbish the Houses of Parliament, we knocked it down 80 years ago. Um, but they were working on the plans for the House of Parliament when this building was being built. The most famous alumnus, and I hope that this is a person who will be known globally across the many countries represented here, is J.R.R. Tolkien, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. Um, uh, and he, uh, I live about 300 yards away from this water tower uh, in Birmingham. Um, and Tolkien lived about 300 yards away from this water tower in Birmingham, in slightly different directions. Uh, uh, oh, where's my book gone? Oh, there's my book, okay. Uh, sorry, that, that's a water tower 300 yards from where I live and where Tolkien used to live. That's a mad folly of a tower about 300 yards away from where Tolkien lived and where I live. A man built it so he could go up to the top of it and gaze down upon his lands. Those two towers, one water tower, one folly, are in fact the twin towers which are central to the Lord of the Rings. Um, so there's Tolkien and Birmingham. Uh, if we move on, this is rather a, 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 a dark painting, a dark tapestry, but if you were to stroll along from here to the Tate Gallery, you'd see it today. Uh, it's an Edward Burne Jones tapestry, um, which is a, who's an also another King Edward's old boy. Um, uh, this tapestry is owned by Jimmy Page, the guitarist of Led Zeppelin. Um, if that gets, if that has global take, I don't know. Um, I was in Shanghai two weeks ago talking about IB and uh, in some other schools, and this is on, this was on the door of, um, of one of the teachers in Shanghai. He said, "My two favourite books are The Hobbit by J.R.R. Tolkien and The Killing Floor by Lee Child, who is the world's most successful pulp fiction writer at the moment. Another product of King Edward's School, Birmingham. They'd be pleased to be in Shanghai. Um, and perhaps most importantly for you as uh, people who are keen on chess." We do have two very famous alumni who are quite important to chess. Uh, this is the imitation game. Uh, the man at the front is Turing. Uh, the man in the middle over him is C.H.O.D. Alexander, uh, the, the, who was, I think, when I was a boy, and when I was a boy, um, Spassky was playing Fisher. Um, when I was a boy, C.H.O.D. Alexander was the chess correspondent for the Sunday Times. But he was a key figure in the, in the enigma uh, breaking, showing the extraordinary power of the world you live in, the world of chess, in solving problems. So, uh, and I can remember walking past his name on the wall at King Edward's School going into assembly. Um, so we do have that. And also, um, Tony Miles is a King Edward's old boy, the first British Grand Master, I believe. Uh, he was at school when I was there. Indeed, he played uh, rugby with my brother 
Uh, my brother played inside centre and Tony Miles played outside centre. They both had very silly haircuts, which is why I've said a picture of the sadly departed Tony Miles from here. So there is, I do have some authenticity in this, okay. However, I want to talk about now, to get away from King Edward's School, which does have a great tradition, is one of the great schools of this country, I know because I was a boy there, and come to the wider question about UK education. Now, many of you are not from the UK, but for about a century, um, Britain has struggled with a very strange situation in its education system. Tolkien studied Latin and Greek and ancient history and not much else beyond the age of 14 or 15. I studied Latin, Greek and ancient history and not much else beyond the age of 14 or 15, um, uh, some, some years later than talking. But in Britain, for a long, long time, we have lived in a world where actually specialisation has been at the core of our educational system. Now that specialisation clearly generates experts but it also generates narrowness. My brother did maths, further maths and physics, whilst I did Latin, Greek and ancient history, and we haven't spoken much intelligently in the last 50 years. <laughs> um, but that polarity, that specialisation, um, generates one of the most famous things written about education uh, in this country in the last, um, perhaps in the last century, C.P. Snow writing about the two cultures. How, as you can see from this quotation, uh, in the end, um, uh, we have too many people, humanity is a known world by some people, science by another, but in a sense though it is a polarity. And that is caused by the British education system, in particular the British university system, whereby British universities have required specialisation and expertise in their own subject, whereas actually they have tended thereby, they have disallowed a broader education from the age of 16 onwards. So what schools teach in the UK, is, particularly in academic schools, in academic subjects, is generated entirely by an imposition which comes from above. And those who live in the UK know that all the examining boards are generated by the universities. No one asks the schools what to teach, the universities just told them. Now that's 1959, um, but now uh, uh, this is 2018. David Willits, a King Edward's old boy, who was a, has been a, a minister in the British government for a long period of time, uh, gave a talk recently, and he was saying that uh, here we are. Um, when you ask specialists what they want, I want more of specialisation so I can t kick them on. However, if you are to ask a different question, what would you like 18-year-olds to do or to know or to be able to do, you might come up with a different question. So as he says, um, um, the scandal is how little physics the historians know and how little history the physicists know. Uh, I did Latin, Greek and ancient history, the only science I know I learned from The Ascent of Man, Jacob Bronowski's unbelievably wonderful television programme, the greatest television programme in history as far as I can work out. But without him on the television in the early 1970s, I would have known nothing apart from Latin, Greek and ancient history. But this world still exists in the UK uh, with that kind of quotation. To a desert island, it's a concept which is running. It keeps the British content on a Sunday morning, basically. Um, but here is, uh, how can I put this, the cleverest man in this country, uh, the president of the Royal Society, um, when asked the question about what he feels okay, um, uh, I want science to be more central to the thinking of the public. I'm also very concerned about where we educate people in science and actually education in general. It's far too narrow. We need to have a broad curriculum to allow the new generation to cope with a rapidly changing world. Um, I believe that all science students should learn history, should learn languages, and I believe humanity students should also learn a certain amount of science all the way through school. Perhaps the people sitting here from your so many different countries uh, would endorse that opinion, because one of the things that happens is scientists never learn a language beyond a very elementary level. Um, and in the same way, uh, people who study humanities and language may find themselves in quite technical jobs with no scientific or mathematical expertise. It's a madness. In this country, we have, you, you can stop studying your own language and mathematics at 16. We're one of two or three countries in the world that do that. Right. Um, Sorry, so it, it goes slowly and then, sorry, I'll keep on coming back. Just sorry, looking, I'm... Just looking at your screen, you're not... What? Just I'm pressing these buttons, I'm doing as you told me. <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right, so, what the International Baccalaureate does, and I speak up this because, not because I'm a development manager, but because at King Edward School, Birmingham in 2010, we abolished A-levels and went entirely over to the International Baccalaureate, a qualification which I'm sure many of you would know because it is the largest international qualification in the world, being operated by thousands and thousands of schools in over 150 countries. One of the reasons why we did it is that uh, in the UK, perhaps in your own education systems, uh, there isn't much philosophy in education. There's quite a lot of syllabuses, quite a lot of past papers, quite a lot of mark schemes, but not much philosophy. Whereas the IB actually started 50 years ago this year with a philosophy. What kind of an education would we want? What kind of thing would we want our young people to be and to study? And I rather like the idea, bearing in mind that most of us would be more concerned about the world than we have since the end of the Cold War, um, that actually how extraordinary these things are. The idea that you might actually have an education which moves towards a peaceful world. An education that moves towards um, the idea of understanding other people and their differences. Um, now, very quickly, how does, how does one do that? Well, answer, instead of the narrow British system of three subjects, which has become the, uh, the beast which has us under its control, what you do is you study six subjects in an international baccalaureate diploma. From six, there, there are younger courses that I'm talking about from 16 to 18. So everybody, there are these commandments, okay, there are these commandments, everybody has to study English or their own language. They have to study another language. They have to study a humanities subject, economics, geography, history, whatever. They have to study a science. They have to study mathematics at some level. And you either do an art subject, music, theatre, drama, or you double up and you do two sciences or two languages or two humanities. So therefore, therefore you have your breadth and then you have your specialisation because some of these things are higher level. Um, where it takes more time, bigger syllabus, etc. But at least, even if I am a scientist, I am continuing to study my own language and its literature. I am continuing to study another language. Um, it also believes in the idea that there are qualities beyond exam results that we might be wanting to develop in our students. And if you think about those things, some of those things may apply to the way in which we play chess, um, but certainly they apply to the way in which we try to live our lives. Um, and here, are the, 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 uh, those are the commandments, is that thou shalt do those things. Here's good old uh, Moses uh, sitting in Rome, okay? Now, this slide is very, uh, not easy to see, but uh, the most important thing about it is, actually, at the heart of it, it has a core about its values. It has a core about how you teach and how you learn. It has a core which is about, actually, you study theory of knowledge and not just subjects. How do I know anything in history or in science or in mathematics? I write an extended essay, and I also have to do a certain amount of service and activity to go with my course. All right? And therefore, on the outside, is also the idea of international mindedness, which of course should appeal to, appeal to all, of, all of us sitting here. Okay. So just very, very quickly, I'm sure I'm out of time. But if, for example, and I expect a lot of your uh, uh, chess, uh, able chess players come from, tend to come from a scientific background. So let's, for example, I've got a bright 16-year-old uh, doing A-levels in, in the UK. He or she would have to study probably maths, physics, chemistry. Uh, maths, chemistry, biology, if they're a scientist. And that would be the sum total of it. You might try and bolt some things on. If you do the International Baccalaureate, then in a sense you do those things which we pay for getting to the best universities at the high, in a very demanding level. Those high level subjects are as demanding as any qualification in any country for an 18 year old. But at least you're still doing something else. Um, with your English, you're continuing to study your own language, reading literature, writing essays, you're learning a foreign language, um, and, you might, and you might, for example, flip your economics, so at least you are doing that as well, which might be the way in which your career might lead. Um, now, finally, that's what the World Economic Forum seems to want, uh, in terms of what do we want for our future in this changing world, and this unforeseeable world. Instead of the narrowness of specialization <coughs> of working on your own, they want collaboration, communication, problem solving, social, all of those things are embedded in the learner profile. So the IB, which has been going for 50 years, actually is very much aligned with what, um, uh, with what the world seems to want um, from its uh, young people. Um, I'm, more inclined, I'm more inclined to end with this. Here is Federico da Montefeltro, the Duke of Urbino, on the left, he has, that's the better side of his face because the other side of his face has been destroyed in a jousting accident. So that bendy nose is his best side. 
Uh, there he is on the right, doing what all good Dukes of Urbino should do, which is sitting in his armour, reading uh, a bedtime story from a very serious book to his young son, Guido Baldo. Um, uh, when he was asked what it took to be a, a, a leader, what it took to, took to be a ruler, he said, essere umano, to be a human being. Uh, and I suppose one of the things I'm standing here to talk about is, sadly, I believe that the education system which has been imposed in the UK, with its narrowness, has concentrated on qualifications and outcomes and specialization. But it actually, tragically, is actually denying people in the UK the chance of actually fully exploring their humanity so that they go into their adult lives with a richness and diversity of experience and thinking and knowledge which will actually make their lives not just more prosperous, not just a better job, not just a better university, but actually a better human being. Thank you. <laughs>